A big Tomb Raider vid has been in the pipeline for months, but well, I kept putting it off. It is a pretty frickin' big project after all, there's like 10 games to cover, most of them frightfully similar to each other. And there's just one big character at the heart of it all, Lara Croft. Love her or hate her, she is kind of a big deal, and if this series does nothing else, it will provide a nice look at just how Lara Croft has evolved through the years. I mean, she's never exactly been a perfect character, but she is one of the most important characters in the history of video games. Despite being surrounded by the 32-bit era, perhaps the least well-remembered time in all of retro gaming. I mean, you know the complaints, don't you? 3D was shite, games were bloated, the voice acting, the lousy FMV, all that stuff. Still, Lara is up there, and in a time when video gaming was actually kinda trendy, she was an icon, a cultural icon. And so, let's look at the whole frickin' Tomb Raider series, all of its hills and valleys from beginning to end, 1996 right up to the present day. In this first video, we'll be going back to the glory days and looking at the first five Tomb Raider games, all of which were released and famous on the PlayStation, but are shown here on the PC because, you know, convenience. You can get virtually the whole series on Steam for next to nothing, you know. But we must go back to a time when Steam was naught but a cool Peter Gabriel song. We need to go back to 1995 and the idea of cool. Because just how did Lara's main platform of choice, the Sony PlayStation, become the hottest sound of the mid 90s? Now, gaming has, of course, always strived for coolness, don't deny it. For total, unconditional acceptance, to be in with the crowd, to be taken seriously by people outside the gaming norm. The more zealous among us can always point at the numbers and say that the games industry is just as big as movies or music or whatever, and always has been, but really there's just a lot of us about. No matter what, no matter how big it gets, it's still, you know, the other thing. By my estimation, games become cool, truly cool, every 15 years or so, meaning it's happened precisely three times in the art form's history, each period lasting for around about a couple of years. It happened in 1980 when Pac-Man was released, <laughs> no question about that, Pac-Man was cool, perhaps the most fashionable games has ever been. It happened again around 2010 I'd say, with the Nintendo Wii, the Kinect, gaming on smartphones and all that, again because everyone was playing, even those who didn't usually play, and a couple of years on there's still a little bit of that cool magic in the air. And it happened in 1995, when Sony released the PlayStation Worldwide. Of all these things, the PlayStation is perhaps the only one that was utterly designed and marketed with basically a single ambition, to be cool by design. That was the ultimate goal. The PlayStation hungered for it, was desperate for it more than anything. And you know what? It got it. <laughs> Not that this was a new strategy, because the 16-bit era was full of it. Sega in particular were desperate to be noticed, to be the alternative, video games answer to the grunge scene, Gen X and all that shit. Just look at the ads for the Sega CD. Pure Gen X gobbledygook. The whole thing screamed of 90s tood, because that was what they believed the people wanted. But more than that, the CD, that was always seen as the future. Games could look like movies, it was the same way you listened to your music. And practically they were so much cheaper to produce than those damn cartridges. Gaming wanted the future to happen as soon as possible, and tried everything they could. The Sega CD was the worthiest attempt, but it was way too early. The 3DO and CDI were more like high-end home entertainment kits than video game machines, PCs were too expensive at that point, and well, the Jaguar CD might just have made it were it not completely shit and broken. In the end, none of them were at that point. Coolness through Gen X style marketing was still a bit too insular and a bit too transparent. A lot of it was poochy level stuff and seriously, seriously uncool. Because when you're truly cool, you know, you don't even have to try. And Sony got that. At least more than most. Once a proposed add-on for the SNES, the PlayStation became kin, wiping out the Saturn, the N64 and the Dreamcast to such an extent that all three are barely memories in the grand scheme of things, let's be honest. 
And it all kicked off by, you know, kind of like the previous example of Pac-Man and the later example of the Wii, being more casual, including everybody. In truth though, what Sony actually wanted was for people who played video games as kids to keep playing them as adults, which is what Nintendo and Sega didn't do with their systems, continuing to go for the kid market. Instead, Sony wanted the line to continue. You played the Mega Drive and the SNES when you were a kid or in your teens or whatever, and then, on your 21st birthday, you bought a PlayStation. The adverts were snippy, the games sold as visual experiences, and the mood was, particularly in Europe where it was massive, one of something designed for after-pub entertainment. You know, you go out on the lash, grab your mates at the bell, and you all go home and play Wipeout without spilling your dollar kebab over the carpet. It started working immediately. Right from the off, the PS1 struck a chord with the grey design, the CDs and the early starts, you know, guys like Crash Bandicoot and whatnot. It fit right in with 90s culture, the lad movements, the Britpop scene. But you know what, a real icon was needed, and it didn't quite have that yet, but it would soon come. Because, you know, over the years, the status of video games' biggest icon has been taken by, what, a half-eaten pizza, a cartoonish Italian plumber, a big-eyed elf, and a spiky blue hedgehog. So, what would be the next up to the plate? A woman, with no pointy ears, no wacky sound effects, no power-ups, just a woman. A real woman and a real human being. Lara Croft. The first Tomb Raider game wasn't originally designed that way, of course. In fact, Toby Gard, lead designer of the game for Core Design, originally saw Tomb Raider's hero as just a wholly male Indiana Jones-esque character. But as the game developed, with more emphasis gradually placed on puzzling rather than action, the character developed from a male placeholder to a more gung-ho South American woman named Laura Cruz, and finally to an upper-class English woman named Lara Croft. It took quite some time, but that was the version of Lara presented to the world in October 1996, just around about the time that this was taking over the world. If you wanna be my lover, Girl power! <laughs> and that was a stroke of luck, wasn't it? The rise of the Spice Girls and all that, yet another British invasion, meant that this game, on an already cool enough system, with a woman front and centre? Yep, it was gonna be a big deal. You know, sometimes you just gotta be in the right place at the right time, and with Tomb Raider, that's what Core Design managed to do. It rode the zeitgeist like a demented Sean White on a golden surfboard. Lara Croft became a worldwide megastar, and the PlayStation went further and further up into the stratosphere. Oh yeah, and the game was released on the Sega Saturn too, but frankly nobody gave a fuck about the Saturn. Speaking of the game, well, uh, how was it? Or rather, how is it? Because we've seen how Lara Croft came to be, but was it actually, you know, decent? Well, playing through this old PC version of the game, yes, it is decent. Unlike a lot of 3D platformers, Tomb Raider has aged very well. I've already gone on record as saying that I very much enjoy the rickety graphics style of a lot of old and primitive 3D games, you know, the incredibly high contrasts, the dirty low-res textures, items made purely out of polygons, so that part of Tomb Raider holds up for me. But the game still plays great too, mainly because it was, in many ways, an evolution of the old cinematic platformer, flashback another world and the like. Lara basically moves on a grit, you know how far each step's gonna take you, how many you're gonna need for a jump and so on, so a lot of the time is spent taking in your surroundings. The camera is such that you're always gonna think about distance, even on the biggest jumps. You know that you usually make it, but you know, will you this time? And when you do make those big jumps, it's odd, because it's always exciting, because there's always that doubt niggling in the back of your mind. The doubt that comes from being totally alone on this adventure, reliant entirely on your wits, knowing that the only way out is forward. The first Tomb Raider also works because of how much emphasis there is on puzzling. The title ain't no bullcrap. We're here, and we're finding treasure. To do so, we're going to have to find keys and other objects, push blocks, take on serious jumping puzzles, and thumb through mazes. All that good shit. Combat is very much secondary, and is usually simply a case of auto-locking on and shooting a lot. It's kind of dull, and probably the worst thing about the game. Nothing compared to the puzzles, the movement, and the atmosphere. It's perhaps like Prince of Persia, most of all, only so much better. 
You can see a lot of the old walls, every level following directly on from the last one, for example, the usage of musical cues and sound effects rather than a constant soundtrack, and the focus on realistic momentum and movement. Tomb Raider wasn't the first attempt at making a cinematic platformer in 3D, but it was by far the best. Nothing even comes close to it. It deserves a high place in the pantheon as one of the most influential platformers ever made, and not just because of Lara Croft. Without Tomb Raider, would we have, say, the Prince of Persia reboot series? Assassin's Creed? Mirror's Edge? I could even stretch it and say that first-person games like Half-Life did take quite a few cues from Tomb Raider. In the giant slew of 3D platformers that came at the start of the 32-bit era, there were basically two games that showed the way forward and inspired others for years to come. One was Super Mario 64, and the other was this. And that's pretty freaking high praise, and utterly deserved to boot. But of course, you can't talk about Tomb Raider for too long before you have to bring the focus entirely on Lara. Because she's at the heart of it all, the reason for a lot of the success, a lot of the praise, and indeed a lot of the criticism. Because just what can you say about Lara Croft? Opinions on her are kinda mixed. Some have said that she's a feminist icon, others say that few characters are more sexist than Lara in the history of video games, and both sides are, in many ways, absolutely right. Now I've seen it said that the titillation aspect of Lara Croft didn't come to the fore until the game's sequels. To be honest, that's not really the case. Tomb Raider has always been a killer to study from the male gaze perspective, even here. The camera loves her through every last cutscene, examining every inch of her body. Even in game you can see what the male eye is drawn towards the most. You judge the distance of jumps primarily through aiming Lara's arse at the platform. Listen to how Lara's actions are always paired with audible physical exertion every time she bumps into an object or pulls herself up from a ledge. When she's idle for a moment, she's visibly panting, her whole body moving. Oh, and of course, there's those incredibly large breasts. And also, there's the amount of detail that just went into every excellent animation, including several moves that aren't even necessary. I mean, do you need to perform a swan dive into the water? Do you need to perform an impromptu handstand when climbing a ledge? No, but hey, you know what? It looks cool. It shows off Core's fantastic animation. And it shows off Lara. Now, before you get your jock straps in a twist, don't worry. I'm not saying that this is directly and viciously sexist, or, to be honest, even all at one. It's kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, sexist by design? The male gaze is something natural, and it gets magnified in creation. You know, it's the idealised vision, the thing that makes any straight dude tick when they see a good-looking woman walking down the street, the trigger that can turn literally anybody, even the most cack-handed operator ever, into Federico Bloody Fellini when they're given a camera and a subject of the opposite gender. Just look at a similar platformer from the era, uh, Fade to Black. Yeah, it's a rubbish game, but hell, just to look at the generic and shoddy way that Conrad B. Hart moves about. It's clear no one cared about him in any way whatsoever, even to the point of making him move realistically. Lara Croft, on the other hand? Well, the designers took steps they didn't even have to do, and they made sure to focus on Lara every step of the way, as much as possible, including sticking her white at the front of the marketing. The end result is first rate, far more advanced than anything else at the time. But you're always aware that, even though the game is about a woman, a man is very much at the helm, behind the camera, so to speak. And, well, you wouldn't be aware of that if this was a game about Conrad B. Hart. So, you know, your mileage may vary as to how much this actually takes you out of the experience, but it's definitely an interesting way to look at Tomb Raider and, hey, you know, I'm all about that sort of thing. And there is also another side to Lara Croft. Regardless of all that, a lot of woman games players still identified with her. Kara Ellison wrote a fantastic article about her experience as playing Tomb Raider, and how she felt at the time to be so utterly in step with the game, feeling almost as if she was Lara. For a lot of people, the first game managed to create entirely through gameplay alone what, say, the 2013 reboot of the series tried to create through story. That feeling of, I can't do this, I want to do this, can I do this? How the hell am I gonna do this? I'm scared about doing this, 
and so on and so on leading eventually all the way up to I can do this. The first game makes no attempt to destroy that. Direction aside, Lara is quite simply very capable in a normal way. She's just damn good at what she does, and has no need to rely on anyone else. Although she doesn't make her independence a defining part of who she is, she just prefers to work alone, and it's all about the adventure, baby. It strikes a great balance. And, like I said, Cor really did strike gold when they released this game when girl power was big. Sisters doing it for themselves, wasn't it? Okay, I mean, that's an 80s song, but you get the point. Later games in the series would sully the waters a bit by both playing the loner card up further and turning Lara Croft into your archetypal, strong, independent woman, as well as committing that mortal sin. I mean, you can picture the production meeting, can't you? Someone got a dangerous idea, and they decided to run with it. Hey! Wouldn't it be a neat twist if Lara Croft, a character who has always succeeded because she doesn't need anyone, suddenly needs to rely on a male companion? And unfortunately, the appropriate response to that, you know, a blackboard eraser to the face, wasn't delivered. But we'll save all that for another video. Lara had a dual existence. The male-driven design made her the virtual darling of the lads' magazines, party to all kinds of schoolyard chatter about positioning her at just the right spot where you could best take down her particulars. But the character, her independence and the style of the game made her a powerful symbol of female empowerment that was perfect for the time. A symbol on the ground level for tons of gamers worldwide. Because hell, you know, what was there before Lara Croft? Basically Samus Awan and that's it. Lara Croft might not have been perfect, but she was a pretty big step forward for the time. <sighs> so that's Lara Croft as a cultural icon, one that could fit into damn near any situation. So, what does the original Tomb Raider have that a lot of the other games in the series didn't? Because it's not as if the sequels were all bad, but they never quite managed to feel as special. Tomb Raider 2, the first of them, is still a damn fine game. Everything's that little bit bigger, with Lara being sent all over the world this time, you know, we start at the Great Wall of China, move on to Venice and all of its gondolas, take in the white hot sites of Tibet, explore an offshore rig. You know, it's like a student's gap year blog, only with more guns. The core gameplay hasn't really changed at all, but there are a few subtle tweaks. Lara is, after all, now one of gaming's foremost icons, and every effort is made to make her look like a superstar. And not only that, she's England's star. I mean, just compare the voice acting. In the first game, Lara was certainly plummy, eager and British. Thank you. I will. But not to the level of the second. I decided to build this assault course to hone my skills and learn some new ones. I mean, Jesus. So much sophisticado. Wouldn't be a surprise if we found out that she was like 10th in line to the throne or something. And of course, there's many more winks to what the audience of the game want to see, with the ending of the game being perhaps Lara's most iconic scene from the whole period. Don't you think you've seen enough? That gaze, you know, well, got ramped up to the nth degree. It kind of lacks the first game's balance, although that balance was probably unintentional in the first place, but as it is, it's still more Tomb Raider fun. And that was pretty much how the series continued. I mean, I could say the exact same thing about Tomb Raider 3. Core knew what the people wanted and they delivered it. But these sequels did lose a bit of focus on what made the series great. The puzzling, the raiding of tombs. I mean, Tomb Raider 2 barely features any tombs at all, even at that early stage. It's perfectly natural for the games to explore a wider range of surroundings, but they were never quite as memorable as what we saw in the first game. And combat tended to become more of a factor with loads more enemies to fight and whatnot. And as mentioned, combat has never been a strong point of this series. The puzzle elements also never managed to improve too much on the first instalment, with many people complaining that they'd seen all these jumping puzzles, block pushing conundrums and key hunts before. The additions of various other elements such as flashy boss battles and the odd vehicle here and there didn't really improve matters all that much. And it all just means that you get tons more of everything. And the levels really start to feel bloated. Tomb Raider 2's levels are almost uniformly around an hour long right from the off, and Tomb Raider 3 only enhances the problem. The original certainly had lengthy levels too, but hardly all of them. They were a bit more contained and focused. 
So while Tomb Raiders 2 and 3 are both decent games in their own right, they're not special, with every single fault magnified by a factor of 10. It's that old cliché of gaming journalism, that fans of the series will love it, meaning that anyone who isn't a fan of the series won't have their minds magically changed by it. Tomb Raider 2 is certainly the better game of these two sequels, as it's the one where it at least felt like a bit more stuff was added. Tomb Raider 3, yeah, not so much. So I guess we're at around about 1999 now, and make no mistake, the series is still flying high. All three Tomb Raider games were big hits, even if 2 and 3 weren't quite as big as the original. Lara Croft was gaming's most iconic figure, familiar to millions worldwide, so familiar that there was even an official Lara Croft girl used to promote the game at media events and the like. As the first gaming icon to be basically totally human in design, it wasn't exactly a big leap and the role was taken by people like Rona Mitra, Nell McAndrew and the like. And so guess what? We basically have Tomb Raider to thank for the whole idea of Booth Babes. <laughs> yeah, cheers for that. Uh, I digress. While Tomb Raider was still big, core design weren't all that happy. In fact, the writing was kind of on the wall, believe it or not. The pressure to come up with another Tomb Raider game year after year was beginning to wear them thin, especially when it was clear that they couldn't expand on the games all that much without making massive changes. There was too much baggage, and things were starting to get a little stale. Something had to give, in other words. 1999's Tomb Raider 4, The Last Revelation, is once again basically the same thing we've seen before. If, like me, you're a fan of the series, then it's good. In fact, The Last Revelation is notable for being a bit more of a return to the caves, tombs and pyramids of the first game, as opposed to the attempts at cities, offshore rigs and the like that were present in 2 and 3. It's still the same engine, but Core have made a great deal of effort into giving Lara as many new moves as possible, and pulling as much as they could out of the old beast. And you know, there's cutscenes and the like that, for the time, were fantastic. The Last Revelation is easily the best game in the series since the original, no doubt about it. Even if, as usual, it wouldn't change a naysayer's mind, it's a goldmine for fans. But of course it's mainly remembered for the ending, where this happens. Shock! Horror! And yeah, they did. Kor killed Lara off. She went down the well one too many times and finally came a quopper. It's kind of a shocking way to close the book on the first wave of Lara, really. But still, the light was turned off before things got really stale. Having said all of that, there was still a fifth game in 2000, believe it or not. However, Tomb Raider Chronicles was basically a little bit of an extra, a mission pack and epilogue for the series. It wasn't marketed all that much and didn't sell particularly well, strictly for the fans only. And you know, it's not a bad late period PS1 title, but the general feeling was that by this time, shit had gotten pretty damn old. Old engine, old gameplay, old character. By the year 2000, the competition was far heftier. Cutesier games like the Spyro series and Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast were doing well, and even on the more realistic front there were games like Siphon Filter, and a well-loved series called Legacy of Kane, released by a little group known as Crystal Dynamics. We'll be coming back to them later. And so, with the 32-bit era drawing to a close and the PS2 on the horizon, where was Lara going to fit in? Was she going to get lost in the shuffle? Would Lara Croft Mania die down? On the contrary, it was just beginning. And so that ends the first part of our look back at Tomb Raider. Join us in part two, when Lara will move from the console to the big screen. And the resulting success will lead to, what else? Another game. Yeah, Core Design decided to bring Lara Croft back to the home in 2003. And good lord do we all wish they hadn't bothered. But yes, we'll be going through Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, as well as seeing what some other guys would be able to do with the erstwhile British Adventure Queen. A new day dawns with 2005's Tomb Raider Legend. That's all to come, but for now, it's time to end the video. Thanks for watching, and wherever you are, whoever you be, have a good one, take care, and I'll see you next time.